I'm Kevin Day, and you're listening to Alien Theorist Theorizing. All right, we have Kevin Day here. Um, two quick questions before we get started. Kevin, what was the catalyst that got you started on your current path? Well, let me go back to 2004 when this really happened. It was just happened to be my last underway before I retired. It was also my very last real world intercept out of hundreds in my logbook. That was an air intercept controller, uh, hundreds of intercepts in peacetime and wartime operations. And when that, when that happened, I had 18 years of sea time on behind the spy one radar. I was up on watch and I saw this really strange formation of tracks off of Catalina Island. And first time I saw them, I think there was probably five tracks and they were at 28,000 feet going hundred knots. And I was thinking to myself, now that's really strange. I've never seen anything ever fly like that. And I wasn't really worried about them. Um, they were way up there. We were way down to the South and they probably didn't even, probably something civilian related. They didn't even know we were there until the day of that we were going to do the air defense exercise. And I told the captain, I said, hey, sir, you know, we got these unknown objects in our airspace, and I highly recommend that we intercept one and find out what the hell they are, because if we don't, and there's an air-to-air intercept and a mishap, um, someone's going to ask both you and me why we were we were so damn incurious about these things. He said, you're right, Sam Chief, intercept one. And that's kind of how it happened. And um, so I, I went to my, I transferred as soon as we got back to, uh, back to shore and retired three years later, went into defense contracting. And I tried to tell anyone who would listen to me that I thought would listen to me what about this. And I got laughed at and hard. I got scoffed at my former boss. I won't mention his name or the company said, Kevin, what have you been smoking? I, I got so damn frustrated. I, I wrote, I wrote this story in the, um, if I get emotional here, there's, there's a reason. Okay. No, it's all good. Um, I, I wrote down this story in a, in a form of a fictionalized account because yeah, I was so frustrated. It, I, I published it in the Library of Congress with some other short stories, and my book's called Sailor's Anthology. You can go there and find it. It's also online for free. And just in case this story ever did break, my book would be evidence that it really happened. So I, I ended up back home. Um, long story short, I was volunteering at the down at the uh, golf course. I had just reopened the kitchen, playing out, carrying out a plate of food, hadn't hired a waiter or waitress yet. And all of a sudden, hey, who turned off the golf? And then I saw a CNN story. And it was a video that I had in my email all those years ago. I was so shocked, guys. I dropped the plate of food. Oh. Babe, I got to go home. I'll explain later. And uh, I con recontacted some of my former shipmates because we felt obligated to support Commander Fravor's story. One thing led to another, and um, we formed a nonprofit called UAP Expeditions. It's online and also on Facebook. And we we're going back out to Catalina Island with a bunch of real top notch researchers and some really cool gear. And we're going to go back and refine these objects. And of course, um, this didn't stay quiet. So one thing led to another, and um, I started doing a lot of speaking tours and traveling. In fact, um, next week I'm going out back out to Hollywood to do another show and then I'm going to Catalina Island to scout out some of our locations so we're gonna um, set up our data or recording devices at so that's kind of been a nutshell what happened to me awesome and so you fast, and, and that contact in the desert what will you be presenting about just that story or are you going more into depth in, in any angle well you know, by this time um, everyone pretty much knows about the story so I'm gonna talk both Gary Voorhees and myself we're gonna talk about how it affected our lives since that happened right and i i don't know if you've heard of jacques ballet and eric davis the physicist yep they wrote a paper called incommensurability in the physics of high strangeness and in that paper um there's several layers of effects that happen and one of them is uh uh human post effects from this thing it changes you man this thing changes you and i was changed in the, some uh pretty radical ways um and for the better too i think my, my wife might disagree, but 
um, so I, I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to um, pretty much present the story of what happened to me. I'll send you some documents later. I, you probably heard of Dr. Uh, Diana Pasolka too. She wrote up um, American Cosmic. Yeah. Yep. I, I wrote her a letter. I'll send you the letter that I wrote her. It kind of explains my journey, my journey. And that's pretty much the journey that I'm going to talk about at Contact in the Desert. Now, first Thank off, you. listening to your, like, you get emotional and stuff. We've talked about that many times, the frustration it must be to have an experience like this. Cause it ruined did, my career, guys. did it change everything? Really did it change everything for you? Like does everything yeah, change when I, you have that kind of experience? It, for me, it did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. And the, the problem was I didn't realize what was happening to me for a long, long time. I didn't, I didn't even know who we Valley Davis was until just a few years ago. I right. thought maybe I was going crazy, you know, but, what the hell was happening to me? I don't know. Now, for people now. for people who are not familiar with this case, I mean, there's a our show is kind of like a, a bridge show between the fringe and the mainstream. So some people might have heard of it in the news, but might not know much. Can you give us a quick rundown? Because this, this is yours. You're part of the Nimitz encounter, but you were from a different ship. Is that that's right? Yeah, I was on the USS Princeton. We were the air defense commander for the Nimitz strike group, and I was the senior enlisted advisor for the captain, Captain Smith. And Top Gun grad, air intercept controller, had hundreds of intercepts in my logbook, including wartime operations and training operations. And do you want, you want me to retell the story again? No, no, that that's fine. So, like that day when you're when you're looking at these things, w w your first thoughts is it? Are you are you leaning towards that? Like, hey, these could be some potential, like you know, some other countries' crafts, or are you looking at these things right away and going, no these are not no way from Earth? No, not at first. I was thinking it was entirely something civilian-related. They didn't even know we were out there, and they were they represented no type of threat to us whatsoever. We, were, we weren't getting any type of electronic signals from them. They weren't threatening in any way, and um, the only reason why I even became concerned about them is because we were going to put a bunch of aircraft for an air defense exercise in that same piece of the sky. And I was very concerned about safety of flight. Right. And I asked the captain to do an intercept, and that's how that happened. So at what point does it turn from where you're looking at these things and going like, well, hey, maybe these aren't civilian point, crafts either? As, as soon as Commander Fravor, uh, Fast Eagle Flight 01, was that merge plat, which is two objects in the same vertical piece of sky, that object, whatever the hell it was, dropped from 28,000 feet down to the surface of the ocean. I found out later the next day in 0.78 seconds. No sonic moves. Almost instant. Miles an hour or some crazy, um, pulling unbelievable amount of G-forces. Um, that's when I became convinced that we were seeing something not from this Earth. Yeah, because you're, think... you're witnessing like the craft pull Gs and defy like our understanding of physics is what it seems like. Absolutely. Absolutely. I did <clears throat> Commander Fravor short of gas. He goes back to the carrier, <clears throat> back to the Nimitz lands. The next flight takes off. And <clears throat> before I knew it, I had a bunch of uh, aircraft airborne and, and they're all intercepting these things. And at one point, gentlemen, these, these objects were falling straight out of the sky. <laughs> it was like raining UFOs. And it, they would chase them down the surface, and as soon as they got down the surface, the things would react to them. They get in a little dogfight. They went straight back up to 28,000 feet again in less than a second and, and just reformed like a flock of birds would and kept going south at 100 knots. They so, they reacted like a, some super capable flock of birds. So how, like how many objects would you estimate? Uh, they, over the course of about 10 days, if I counted them all up, it was about 100 objects. Oh. And they appeared in groups of... Uh, five to ten at a time, and then the nim and then the encounter that was made famous by the video was just them capturing one of the objects, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a very short snippet from a much longer video. Just so you know, there's a longer video out there because part of the air air control process is when I uh, give an order to do an intercept, the pilot will respond by saying, "Flights on, tapes on." That's his response. So, as, from the moment he gets an order to do an intercept, he turns his tape on. And he doesn't turn it off until the intercept is over. So his tape was recording the whole time. And that the reason why it's so grainy, because, <clears throat> excuse me, this was 2004. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that MPEG is a lot better now than it used to be. 
<clears throat> so I think that's where the graininess came from. The, from when they recorded it off his uh, Atlas, <clears throat> his uh, forward infrared looking radar. Um, right. You no, know, it was very. It probably wasn't a very good image copy. Or, or it was a better copy of first, and then it's been as you as it gets copied, you kind of lose quality at the more times you kind of render it down, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah, because that's a lot of people say like, well, why is it so grainy if it's a Twenty-five million dollar jet fighter, and you're like, "Well, the camera's well, the, the actual film. The actual film was crystal clear." Believe yeah, me. when you yeah, take it off, in all in lots of different the whole light spectrum too. By the way, <clears throat> oh yeah, it's, yeah, it's not just taking visible light. You've got infrared and everything else. Yep, yep, you betcha. So you said over the course of the uh, the five days, so almost a week, they were encountering these aircraft, and they were um, they were scrambling jets. To go look at these uh, still after Fraber and and their uh, and then no, it's like two other yeah. companions. We became concerned for about the airspace itself, so we actually ended up canceling our air defense exercises out of uh, safety of flight concerns. So it, we continued to track them and report them on radar, and our data links go back to um, shore installations too. So these things are getting reported up the chain of command the whole time. So on Good. on your radar, could you give us a guess at about the si like the size, approximate size of these from the radar signatures, or is that you just get a general impression of like where they? Does it give you just location and distance? <clears throat> the radar itself is it going to give you a size indication? Um, Commander Fraber got eyeballs on it though, and he said it was about right. the same size, the zone uh, forty-seven feet long or so. Big giant. And then were back. they all? I mean, from the the communications that uh, that you were privy to while you were stationed on the Princeton, like, did they give any indication that all of the were all of the objects the approximately the same size, or were they all yeah. uh, were they all di of the uh, differing in sizes? They were all the same size according to the pilots. And so you, okay, they, so it's like wow, that's like a hundred fa 18s flying yeah, around. Said, that's a, whoa. These things were alive. They. They, whatever that was, it was either artificial intelligence or it was actually something alive in it, or if not alive itself, some form of life that we don't know about. Were you picking Sorry up multiple that. radar contacts or is it only just like, would you pick up like one at a time or was it no, like, how did multiple, they, how did they appear? Like this. Like if spaced my, out? My fingers are contacts on the screen. They just, they're going real slow down the screen. So in, like in formation. Yeah. In, you know, in loose formation. And, you know, like, because I, I mean, everyone here has seen, you know, been to an air show or something and seen pilots fly in formation. How does this kind of formation differ? Like, were their maneuvers, like, way better than anything anyone would kind of see at, like, an air show of, like, planes flying in formation? Like, the maneuverability? Like, would they would they all stay in the exact same unison? They stayed in, the, they stayed in this exact, they picked them up off Catalina and tracked them just like that all the way in interestingly enough you know we're moving our radar envelopes moving all over the ocean all over the operations area but every single one of those contacts faded from radar in this exact same latitude longitude position with, with right above guadalupe island off the coast of mexico and that's why when lou elizondo came to interview me as soon as i said that he's like i'm going there <laughs> right so that's how it, that's well hey listen I'll, I'll i'll take any excuse to go to mexico too all right <laughs> <laughs> all right I, I'm, I'm a big fan of cervezas i'll go down there <laughs> me too i'll buy <laughs> deal um, um i know from your other interviews like uh specifically the the piece of equipment the radar equipment that you were working with at the time now did it have i think you mentioned something about its its effective ceiling is like twenty eight thousand feet Oh no! Something like that. Um, we we use these things for ballistic missile defense, and so they can actually track objects up into the lower lower space. Low orbit. Right. So so, but you, uh, I know you commented on the these some of these crafts seem to drop out from lo like higher atmosphere, like almost from outside the atmosphere to that's sea level that's pretty that's quick, that's right? That's exactly what's happening. They, our, our ballistic missile defense team was tracking these things from space. They first went to eighty thousand feet. And stayed there for a while. And that, you know, as an air defense guy, um, um, <clears throat> I don't usually look that high, so I wasn't really paying attention that high. My console is set up in just a certain way, and but then they would they would go from eighty thousand feet down to twenty eight thousand feet, and that's where I would, that's where I became concerned that these things were coming from space. 
at like <clears throat> mock whatever like almost instant instantly. right yeah yeah instantly like at that yeah, speed you're almost like you're almost instead of measuring in mock you're almost measuring in like speed of light almost like it's going so well, fast let me, let me tell you another little story um in uh carrier strat defense like if this is a carrier we have points in space called combat air patrol stations and we'll station aircraft out there in case we get attacked we've already got we're already set up somehow this object um went for commander chase uh favor he chased it down to the water this thing reacted to him and that object whatever it was went 60 miles to his cap station right on the latitude and longitude right on the assigned altitude in less than two seconds sorry cap cap station yeah, combat air patrol station. Oh, yeah. okay, gotcha. And like in yeah. almost instant. Yeah, and, and, and how did it know where that point was? He hadn't even gone there yet. Like he, the, the craft beat him to his point he was going to. Yeah. And yeah. Some, and, somehow how, he knew. How did it even know? <laughs> yeah. It's like scanning their comms or something, or. Yeah, that's. I mean that that's crazy. <laughs> it's that's some side, sort of intelligence of like even understanding like our like how we operate, basically. Yeah. Maybe, but you know, who who? I mean, this is such a crazy technology we're talking about. It's it's unheard of on Earth. So it's you know we we can't even fathom what it is. The one thing I really uh, love about your story, Kevin, is is that you talk about like basically how the like. The government and your superiors have basically gaslit you for years, saying that like you're crazy, that kind of stuff. How does it feel to get this kind of vindication? In the arms of the theorists. We're all out of beer Please help out the theorists Please, we need some more beer legend for a theorist on empty every day innocent theorists are verbally abused shot down or roasted and are crying out for your help please check out our patreon at patreon.com slash alien theorist podcast with over 100 hours of bonus content for just 16 cents a day you can help a theorist raise their glass with wine whiskey other various inebriants and love Join in the next 30 minutes, and you'll be enjoying extra segments and podcasts such as co-conspirators, ATT confidentials, nerds, and many more future segments. Right now, there's a theorist who needs you. Your donation says, you guys are dummies, but you're pretty funny. Please donate. Right now. I didn't understand the questions they asked again, please. Oh, like, how does it feel to get the kind of vindication where it's like, you know, everything that you saw and you thought you were going crazy and people were telling you what you're smoking, it's, you, you're you now sitting there going like, now, look, this is exactly what I was talking about. It's not, it's proof. Like, how does that feel? Um, it feels like I've been vindicated. It really does. Right, because, I mean, all, all the... Really and eyewitnesses have come forward now a lot of us yeah because you're you're part of this you're tracking these things on radar years later uh david commander david favor comes out which allows you which like kind of vindicates you who other what other people have come forward of you know of that era saying telling the story i'll, I'll send you a, um as soon as we're down here i'll send you a list of the people that have come forward and how they're involved in stuff. 
Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yep. So it was you and your entire top watch team. Like, what's the what's the complement of your your top watch team on the? Wait, you were on a is it a CCG? You're on the Princeton, then, right? I was on the Princeton. Right, and so it. Uh, were I you seeing most of this? Like, you could see these things. You were on top watch at the time. Did you did you have visual? You had visual confirmation. You said you did at first. Like that's the first time you noticed something was kind of weird, or did you just just see the radar signatures first? I saw the radar signatures at first. Um, the pilots that were airborne uh, had visual on these things, but I, I never did, just on radar only. And then these pilots, they came across. So are all the, just for clarification, are all of the, they were flying FA-18s, right? Hornets? Correct. And then they were, yeah. are all of them mounted with the, the FLIR, the forward-facing uh, infrared, or is it just Frabers? They all, They all are. Okay. And then they launched other, there, there were actually other aircraft as well. And that, that strike group, there's not just Hornets, right? That I, I remember reading that they pro they had perhaps launched another aircraft that was more, uh, capable of kind of doing a, like a recon, like a reconnaissance aircraft. Yeah. The E2 Hawkeye is a big radar plane with the radar dish. Right. Did they, did they the confirm form. that they, what you were seeing on radar as well? They did, in fact, yes. Oh, cool. And then I think, like, so how many, what was the most signatures at one time did you pick up on your your ten. radar? Ten. Ten, ten times. Right. And okay. over that over the course of a couple of days, if you added them all up, it was about 100 contacts altogether. Wow. Right. right. Okay. Was, it, was, it, was it, like, during, during those days where they spread out, was it, like, was, can you remember, like, which day probably had the, the most contacts where they're or were they just like was it like five we you know let's see five days so what they're like 20 every day yeah yeah were, and then were they the same craft or was it like would they go leave come back or would you just you had constant contact and then once they left the the area or outside of your radar range uh did they were gone for the whole day yep they would fade off radar um, and then you wouldn't see them the rest of the day. Like they would just come in for was, was there a certain was there a certain there span a of time? When, uh, we tracked several groups of these things. We um, they came on radar up by San, uh, San Clemente Island and faded from radar off of the coast of Mexico off Guadalupe Island. And okay. they all be so they were always smaller. in the same. They're always in the same like area that you guys yes. were patrolling. Yep, right above us. Right above us the whole time. And what was it like? Was it was it like the talk of the ship at the time when this was happening? And like, is is this kind of like everyone's talking about it on the ship, or is this kind of like hush hush? Like no one's, no one's really everyone's supposed to talk about it. About it. Yeah, there, we, you know, we weren't out there by ourselves. We had the aircraft carrier had a couple other ships with us from our strike group, and we're all talking about what the hell are these things? Right. Because I had never seen anything like it before. I had hundreds of. I'm a top gun graduate, been the top gun school at. Um, had hundreds of intercepts in my logbook over the years, and uh, and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of times sitting behind the Spy One radar, and I had never seen anything like that. Not even close, probably. Not even close. Nope. Man, that's. It's had. I I had one other question that I wanted to ask. Now I just. It's... Had a mind blank. I had a mind blank. It'll come back to me in a second here. <laughs> uh, there's a there's another intriguing part to your story that I I know that you've talked about before, and that is the matter of the audio logs or the communication logs that were supposed to be recorded during that time. Yeah, I think when you were you said that you were putting together your report that those that you were attempting to put together a a detailed report as you as you should have and what you you know felt you need to do, and then those logs weren't there they weren't you weren't able to access them is that correct uh at, at the time um i i wrote a naval message about i wish i had a copy of it but we didn't guys we didn't know what the hell it was I, for sure yeah no one in our strike group um it was a, it's, to this day it's a mystery what the hell were those things you tell me. 
now the uh oh my god i forgot it again i had it i was gonna write it down but i forgot my pen um something to do with radar what was i gonna ask damn it <laughs> give me that pen for next time it comes yeah to let's me. take a take a pen yeah, yeah. um uh so what I was I was trying to figure out is that uh, I used to I used to be in the Navy as well. Uh, I was on the USS Blue Ridge uh, out of uh, Yokosuka, Japan, and I remember during like East Watch training, uh, surface warfare training, like they took us up there and they showed us that that at least in the top, like they had they had recording devices for all comms that were going through the ship. So comms, you know, communications between the what was going on and what you were receiving and that stuff gets written down and it gets made a point of record so oh, yeah. those those discs or those that like those data discs that they have that are written down the, like those weren't you couldn't find those correct like you were trying I, I, you know, that was a interview from a, a few years ago but um like you weren't able to find those discs or they perhaps had had gone missing at some point like they were supposed to be there but they weren't confiscated maybe they were there they're of course classified right um everything got recorded and well we just well, don't know we don't know where they are at this point like so all of those co those comms are either classified at you know probably the highest one of the higher levels unable to be accessed yeah. at this point yep yeah. Because I'd be interested because we have the audio uh, that came with the videos like you have the videos of, of Commander Fravor and them, uh, you know, get in contact, like managing to, to catch it on the auto track and whatever, which is, is pretty exhilarating. And I imagine that the other audio recordings from other pilots that were dogfighting with these other uh, the other craft, uh, probably those ones would be interesting to listen to as well. But so it's, it's a shame we can't find them at this point. <laughs> Now, Kevin, the last the last question I had for you is, you know, because of the amount of the amount of crafts, the amount of crafts that were involved, uh, you know, catching this thing on radar. Do you think that in the future we could expect to see potentially more videos or more evidence from this specific encounter uh, come out in various Freedom of Information Act requests? Uh, is is there possible? Po is it possible for there to be more to come from this incident? Yeah, maybe even uh, more people will come forward, right? And give versions like some of the pilots and stuff will come forward and talk about it. One thing leads to another. Definitely, um, I got I got one question. I know you've said like you don't know what these things could have been, but speculation. Like now that you've come out, other people have probably contacted you with similar experiences and theories get put together. What what do you think this could be? Do you think this might is this an an earthly earthly craft from a like advanced from a different nation advanced or do you what do you think this could be <sighs> and if you don't know this get this is this, this is a show about speculation and if <laughs> get get as wild as you want I, I i believe they um they're not us right <laughs> whatever it was i don't think it was us they they were they were definitely real objects. Yeah, it's not swamp gas and weather balloons. No, this time, no, not this, <laughs> no. no, not not a repeated event like this that yeah. happened over days and days with multiple objects, multiple people, radar signatures, maneuvers that seemed impossible for human, or at least like a like a biological life form. The G force would just turn you to mush, pretty much. You bet, it sure would. Huh. This is a, it's a really, it's a really great, I, it's a great story. And I'm, I'm happy, you, I'm happy you and Fravor and others are coming like forward with these type of encounters because civilians don't get, you know, people see stuff, but that's about it. You don't get radar tracking. You don't, you know, you don't get comms. You don't get any of this stuff. It's usually just, you know. Well, and, and I'd like to thank you personally for coming forward because like your story and, and people like you coming forward, like you also, you get vindication, but you're also giving vindication to people who have seen things that they can't explain. And, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, you're crazy. You didn't see that. And when they hear your story, it, you know, it, it vindicates them as well because they're like, I've seen something strange in the skies as well. Uh, so thank you for coming forward and, you know, kind of stepping out of the shadows and uh, 
letting people know that this is real and this really happened. My pleasure. All right, and you said you're working with a nonprofit. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, you are, we formed a nonprofit called UAP Expeditions, and um, at some point we plan to go back out there and look for these things again. And how, how can people support the cause or get involved? Is, is there a website we can direct people to? Um, contact me on Facebook. Kevin Day on Facebook, and yeah, you'll send the information if people. So if yep. you got to be more interested. You can't just if you con contact the man directly, he'll he'll get you involved. Yep, I perfect. Will answer questions. Right on, and uh, we we look forward to hearing your story told more in depth at Contact in the Desert coming up here in June. For people who don't know, June twenty fifth to June twenty eighth, Kevin Day will be part of the conference. Uh, it'll be virtual this year, as with many other conferences. And yeah, you'll be giving more of a personal encounter and how it affected your life. So we're looking forward to that. Me too. All right, Kevin, thanks for taking the time out of your day. All right, guys. We'll talk to you again. Thanks for being interested. Take it easy. Okay. Take thank care, you. Kevin. Bye. All right, bye. That's a cool story. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's cool to hear someone that... Uh, um like the emotion in his voice, especially at the beginning when he's telling, like, you know, we've talked about that before and I've said that. I'm like, imagine seeing something and your whole view of life changes because you're like, this is something not from here. Like, you you just know. And then your whole life changes and you have people saying that. Like, you would feel like you're going fucking crazy. So it's like, um, to me, it's like this guy's living what I always kind of thought my head would go through, like you would go through. He's living it. Um, so he has lived it. It's super interesting. I really like that story. I was, uh, I listened to another interview and I, I was pleasantly surprised today about how interested, uh, interesting he was. Anytime someone who is involved in military that comes forward. Yeah. Now, if Dan would just, come forward with that story he yeah. got when he got probed. Yeah, Dan's got a. <laughs> what's your UFO tale, Dan? <laughs> Dan is too busy he's, spinning he's wrenches. Lucky enough. I was going to say, like, he's lucky enough he got to work on the top watches. I was working in the bottom of the ship. I, there was at one point that I didn't see the sun for two weeks. So if you're asking me about what I saw in the open seas, I didn't see shit. That's like gauges and steam. That's yeah. it. <laughs> More steam! <laughs> um, like, that's it. No, it's uh, it's interesting that, like, you know, like, you hearing those account of all that time, it's like, you know, Dan made a good point when we kind of had some technical difficulties. It's like, why do we only have one video? And it's like, maybe that's the only video that's been released. Like, maybe we can expect more, you know, in the future from this specific event. I'm not going to say other events because I don't have faith that if it's not already out there that the government would release anything. But because this one's already released, maybe this will come with more information in the future based on this specific event. Well, there's actually at Contact in the Desert there is supposed to be new videos released similar to the ones released by To The Stars Academy. Yeah. Like three or four more military videos, but they're I mean, they're hyping them up, so I'm I'll stay tuned. Yeah, we'll find I'm out. I'm hoping it's not just those videos that they released with the little, the I little hope specks of light <laughs> <laughs> recently. Like, I, if it's those ones, I'll be pissed. I hope it's the Nimitz <laughs> video, but they've just flipped it. <laughs> it's going left to right. They just time. change the color, like the color scheme a little bit. Yeah. Like no, we've I, colorized it. Like, oh, thanks. I hope we get the legit HD version. Yes. Yes. If the, if it's going to be the same video, the H like the original, the the more high def. This the one you see has definitely been copied and like downscaled. Um. See, it's 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 interesting, but I would like to see more people from that ship come forward. I think we have a handful now. Um, I mean, he's going to send us a list of all of them, but, uh, we're, we're going to dig in. It's cool that he's accessible. Like you heard him. Kevin, Day, him on, on, Kevin Day on Facebook. Get him on Facebook. If you want to get involved with a nonprofit, um, studying these things. Um, yeah, there was another point of the story. I forgot to ask, um, but they did, they did bring up the, the point in one of his other interviews that, um, according to like Fraber and those who had like firsthand, visual contact or those I think on the Nimitz, like they were more or less asked or forced to sign NDAs, right. like non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. But he wasn't. 
Kevin Day wasn't asked to do any of that. Like, well, none, of that maybe, none of that came up. Maybe because, I mean, I'm, we just had him, but these are questions we can ask him in the future is um, maybe that's because he didn't actually visually see anything. Just radar. He's just seeing blips, right? And going like, hey, this isn't normal. Right. But other than that, he doesn't have visual. Like these pilots are like, there's something in the fucking skies that I'm chasing that's outmaneuvering us like crazy. Like, to me, that information, rather than, like, you have a radar tech, not to, like, you know, lesser his involvement, but he's like, I I picked something up. It was acting strangely. To me, that's easier for someone to be like, it was it was swamp gas and some helium balloons flying up, testing. And then people are like, oh, yeah, sure, because he didn't visually see anything. But when you, when you pair his, like, story with the eyewitness accounts, it, like, just paints a bigger picture. Right. Yeah. And I definitely like to see like some more of the actual pilots come forward yeah. to be like if they if they scrambled as many jets as they were doing and they were concerned. I mean, from from Kevin's analysis, I mean, he said that these things weren't didn't appear aggressive at all. No. They didn't. They only appeared intelligent. I mean, they showed intelligence uh, as far as as far as he was concerned. And but they weren't aggressive in any way. So you had these jets just like chasing these 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 craft that were as large as them like so these are like the same size as almost as a you know an f-18 Hornet. it's yeah. not small <laughs> and five to ten at a time squadron zipping all over the place um yeah and red squadron you know. gold squadron green squadron all right. flying around interesting interesting how they flew like he explained in that like you know formation I, that drone formation right like uh they put, per- put five fingers on the screen he's like they flew like this and perfect and perfect unison up down right it kind of makes me think that maybe they're not individually piloted and it's controlled by some sort of a dro- high, a drone like hive mind or something like in in a mothership up and they're it's just remote right they're just well that makes sense to me if say if et's they're biological they would have to experience you know gravity as we would yeah, but if their or, crafts don't operate how we understand, like maybe there's, maybe, but I'm speculation that it makes more sense for me that these are drones, like they're being controlled. Like yeah. there's may, might not be something in them. Yeah, but yeah. We- I I wanted I wanted to get more into details about like what the time window of when he saw these because he said they saw them approximately like in the same location every day over those five days, like they were in the same place. But it was always I I kind of should have got more into like what time of day it was. And then they, they just take off and then they're gone for the whole, the rest of the day. Well, he like said they, they would periodically come back because they'd come up, they'd appear about around five times throughout the day. Right. Right. So it's like, so they would just shoot up and then come back down shoot up, come back down. I mean, that makes it interesting to be like, well, what are they doing? Yeah. They're training. Like, they're doing training missions as well. Yeah. Earth exercises. What for- I thought was really interesting is they said like, what did they call their forward? Like the, the clear it's the yeah the forward facing infrared camera yeah no no the the point where the planes were supposed to meet in case the CAB, oh the combat patrol yeah, area, CAP. Whatever, yeah. so they're like CAP. They, how about air patrol because when point. you when you listen to fravor's account he says like oh we, we were advised to proceed to that point and this object beat us there like it knew where we were going and it was there before we could even blink and you're like okay well how does it know that that's where we're going Right. Like, yeah, is it picking up comms? Is it like maybe it's some sort of like artificial intelligence, right? Like, and it's just it comes down and like as it's there and it's picking up comms and that it's just sorting that shit out. Or it's a geographical thing because it could be like, well, why did they pick that for their combat air patrol point? Is it based on like, is it like latitude, longitude? So is it like they, they, this is the, but like, this is the best place to have our combat air patrol or is it, because I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I know that he said they were doing exercises. So usually when you have a carrier group, you have like, you know, you have the carrier in the middle, then you have your other ships like a spread out yeah. over a large area. Um, so I'm wondering if it was like they were moving and then the combat patrol, the combat air patrol point was moving with them or whether it was determined like just geographically, like it's, it's this far from, you know, like I said, it's like latitude, longitude, like yeah. this point is far enough to whatever. So Wait. whether they were trying to, whether they're trying to base their whatever if it is aliens like their technology is it like okay this latitude longitude is the ideal place for us to or optimal place for us to it, go <laughs> well it, it, see that seems weird that like the they would they would determine a place whether or not the 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 combat patrol point was moving fixed however 
It's that they decide that that's where we're going. And then this thing is now there before them. There, it, it, it does, it does kind of, for me, make me think that they're aware of what we're doing. Like, they're whatever this was was conscious like i don't think it that's a coincidence like that's just a uh you know a happy coincidence that they're like they see these things they're like okay let's move to this position hey that thing is moved to the position we're going to take it, perhaps but it also moved to like every position yeah everywhere but it's <laughs> everywhere like a specific point right like a combat yeah. patrol area it's like it's just like an area yeah so it's like I and actually I don't know how large the area was. I'd probably have to look that yeah, up. Yeah, I guess or maybe. It's but it's it could be like a hundred kilometers. Be, <laughs> yeah, it could be a like a huge area, and it yeah. just happened to be there, um, or heading in that direction. Yeah. So I don't know, but yeah, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of questions that could be answered if uh, you know, a couple more pilots and a couple more people in that carrier strike group that yeah. were present during those exercises and during this incident would come forward, and you could be like, well, we can answer all these questions. You know what? Right. Let's hear it. Let's I, get them out. I do. I do like that. You know, when when we press him, like, what it, what are, what are these? Things? He's just like, listen, I don't know. I believe it's not us. That's it. Like, well, them, as far I, as other events, you know, atmospheric phenomenon, right? Yeah, it wasn't but fucking this, but, Venus and Gatorade fucking shining through fucking atmospheric refraction, this is lighting what, a weather balloon, crab nebula. Yeah, so repeat you know, plasma, a, plasma, a repeating um, event. Yeah, <laughs> with yeah, fast radio bursts. Yeah. <laughs> Causing magnetic distortion in the ionosphere, creating orbs that fly in formation repeatedly yeah. Yeah. over multiple days in the same mm -hmm. geographic region. The Aurora Borealis <laughs> at this latitude, at this lunch latitude, at this time of day, localized in your kitchen. <laughs> yes. If you go from Can a sci-fi sci point, <laughs> hypothetical. So you have this ET species. They've been observing Earth watching us waiting for the time maybe their armadas on the way and we they see us training like doing our training missions and they're just like observing us so when the takeover comes they know exactly how we operate just taking intelligence right exactly like they have some scanners and shit that's just like it's picking up all of our what we think is like we're sharing secretly they're just picking it all up and whatever ai they have on board is just absorbing it and it's like yeah we know we five days we understand their tactics these are these are scout ships and yeah. pr pretty soon you're going to see like a large glowing object form in the sky yeah muamua Mua passed by muamua Mua passed by dropped off a bunch of well, i guess that wasn't this is 2004 so. i'll just call up will smith to kick the tires and light the fires baby and get him up there <laughs> welcome Look, to they flew they flew the same jets like those are the same jets from oh really from independence Inde yeah fa 18s though well those are fucking old fighters but yeah now and they've been old fighters for a long time but yeah those are the same those are the same jets hmm. cool so it's just going to be independence day um all right what else uh anything else before we wrap that one up no it's cool i want to try and get to when more people come out we'll try and bring them on yeah if we can all right guys take it easy and keep those eyes on the skies Peace. To keep up to date with all things alien theorist theorizing, follow us across social media on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, and Facebook. For updates on new videos and content on YouTube, don't forget to click like and subscribe and hit that notifications button to keep those eyes on the skies with alien theorists theorizing. <laughs>